Morning. I'd like to call the regularly scheduled Planning Commission for November 9th, 2017 to order. If you would, please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. The Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. I think the next thing is uh, swearing in Mr. Horgan on his reappointment. So yes. congratulations. Yes. <laughs> I voted for you. <laughs> Quintana Acevedo representing the clerk's office. I'm here to swear in Mr. Horgan. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that you will support, protect, and defend the Constitution and the government of the United States and of the state of Florida, that you are qualified to hold office under the Constitution of the state, and that you will faithfully perform the duties of the Planning Commission, the office on, upon which you are about to enter? I do. Thank you. Congratulations from the clerk's office. <clears throat> Thank you very much. The uh, next item is uh, announcement. Miss um, Knapp, are there any changes to the agenda or announcements? Good morning, Commissioners. There are. There's one. PDR 1716G, Woodlands of Manatee, LLC, Coventry Park. There's revised stipulation C2 and additional public comments that are attached to the memo. This concludes the changes, um, but I'd also like to take this time to introduce uh, a new face at the staff table. Um, Robert or Rob Knable came to us um, a few weeks ago. He's our new planning section manager for the environmental section. Okay. Welcome, Welcome Rob. Welcome. Good morning. We'll see if we can uh, duly indoctrinate you. Thank you very much. Put on your seatbelt. There's one next to you. Um, Ms. Shank, are there any changes or comments from the county attorney's office? No changes, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. All right. We're going to... Um, I don't see um, any minutes listed on the agenda, but we had minutes for approval. Yes, they're on the agenda update. Oh, the I'm handout. sorry. Mm, I apologize. She didn't make it in time for her uh, to put them on the agenda. Okay. Okay. They were printed. There's All right. Three of them. Okay. Yeah, there, there were three, August 10th, September 14th, and October 12th. So um, have the commissioners had an opportunity to review the minutes for those three meetings? Mm -hmm. um, question, do we have to do each one separately? Okay. Motion to approve the minutes. Okay. Um, are there any changes to the minutes? Mm -hmm. Okay, the uh, chair will consider a motion. Motion to approve as submitted. Thank minutes. you. Uh, there's a motion, is there a second? Okay. Second, Mr. Horgan. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, like sign. Chair votes aye. Motion passes five to zero with two folks <coughs> being absent. So, all right, thank you. All right, the next item on the agenda is um, citizen comments. So this is an opportunity for any folks in the audience who wishes to speak on an item that is not on the agenda. If you have a, um, a desire to speak on an item that is on the agenda, we have one today, the Woodlands Project, uh, Woodlands of Manatee County application. Uh, you'll have an opportunity at a, at a later time in the hearing to speak on that. But this is for items not on today's agenda. So is there anybody who wishes to speak to um, make a comment on items not on today's agenda? Oops. Okay, seeing no one come forward, we're gonna close the citizen comment portion of the hearing and we're gonna move on to the, um, the um, advertised public hearing. So um, originally this was presentation upon request, but we have a uh, speaker card, so we're just gonna go ahead and hear this um, application as if it, uh, as a typical application. Um, so to um, provide comment or testimony today, you're gonna have to be sworn in. So if you plan on speaking um, today at the hearing, please rise to be sworn in. Do you swear or affirm that the factual statements and factual representations which you are about to present to this board will be truthful and accurate? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. 
All right, thank you very much. I'd like to remind everybody today is a quasi-judicial um, hearing, so you'll have to be sworn in to, to provide testimony. Um, Ms. Knapp, can you please read this item into the record? Item number two is PDR 1716G, Woodlands of Manatee, LLC, Coventry Park. This is a general development plan for 170, 170 single-family semi-detached and detached residential units on approximately 105 acres in the Res 3 future land use category and zoned plan development residential, generally located west of Erie Road, approximately 800 feet southwest of the intersection of Erie Road and 69th Street East in Parish. Thank you very much. Um, have there been any ex parte communications uh, with any of the commissioners? <clears throat> no disclosures. So thank you very much. Um, Ms. Boyd, could you please uh, introduce this application? Tia Boyd, planner for Manatee County, and I have been sworn. At this time, I'd like to pass it over to the applicant. Thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Ed Vogler. I'm the attorney for the applicant. I have been sworn, supported today by an incredible team of planners and engineers and environmental consultants, and we will answer all of your questions. But I wanted to frame um, for you early the questions that are going to be presented today. Presently, this land has a valid preliminary site plan approval for 256 residential units. What we're changing about that is the density and the second part of that original existing plan approval, which is there was a 25% commitment for affordable housing units that were provided as a bonus and a fast track for that project at that time. That's not the market for this project today. 69 of those would be townhomes, attached townhomes. So now we've conceived and are pursuing a revision where now this will become a general development plan for 170 units and we eliminate the affordable housing element of that project. It becomes a 55 plus gated community. And so, um, there's a standard and there's a, a program for regulating 55 plus and we comply with that. The second means of access is an emergency access only. And I've, I've heard some, read some comments about how resident traffic from our project will go through the second means emergency access, but that's not accurate. When you have an emergency access that is gated and controlled so that only emergency vehicles will utilize that um, access. The southern part of the property is what is known as the Cedar Drain. It's really a canal. The development will install a culvert, not a bridge, but a culvert, properly sized over the canal to allow the proper uh, flow of waters and the secondary emergency access. I checked and it's also true that the property to the south, which is called Woodlands Lake Second Edition, all of those roadways are dedicated to the public and our public roads. So in a normal connectivity, it would be easy to conceive of all of the project traffic going through there on a public road. We've elected not to propose that with respect to our neighbors to the south, but also because our conception is for a secure gated community with private roads and an entrance off of Erie Road. The entrance, uh, second means of access is a preferred alternative and the emergency basis because Erie Road is being widened and there are wetland impacts along Erie Road and drainage requirements that are being accommodated. So we have worked with your staff to make these alignments appropriate. On the south boundary, <coughs> south boundary, we talked about the canal there's vegetation, there's stabilized base, there's a 50-foot roadway, and all of these act as physical buffers from the adjacent residential uses. On the north, you can see on this plan, the north, there's a very large uh, series of wetlands. There's only one little eyebrow where residential units are actually near the, near the boundary. But there's a perimeter buffer, of course. There's significant vegetation which will remain. And what's interesting on the north side of this site, 
there's an 80-foot railroad right-of-way, 80-foot between this development project and the adjacent development project. So not only do you have all the normal buffers, the fact of the wetlands, the wetland buffer, you have an 80-foot separation between the projects as well. This property is in the Buffalo Canal watershed, and we have to reduce our pre-development rate of discharge by 50%. And so what that means for, for everyone um, that's not an engineer like myself, I've had to study this. Um, today, you've got vacant land that is not developed. So after development, after all the roads, and after all the roofs, and after all the impervious surface, we still have to reduce the rate of discharge by 50% post-development. And that is done by uh, engineering magic. Mm. And that's what uh, our friend uh, Jeb Mulock does. So we've worked on this with your staff. And uh, I just wanted to highlight those areas because we read some of the comments. And we want to make sure we address the points of concern. Good morning, Planning Commissioners. I'm Rachel Layton. I'm an AICP planner with ZNS Engineering, and I have been sworn. And I've got a brief presentation to go through with you this morning because we want to make sure that we're addressing everything um, and, and setting the record to explain what we've been doing. So um, again, we're here today seeking recommendation for approval of a general development plan. And that preliminary site plan that Ed referenced earlier is actually still valid. So we could build upon that now, but we wish to make changes that we think are more compatible with the area. So you can see the site here is a triangular shaped piece of property. It's approximately 105 acres in size, and we have access directly off of Erie Road before it turns, and then can connect back with 69th Street where you have the Buffalo Creek Golf Course, Buffalo Creek Middle School, and Virgil Mills uh, Elementary School. We have a number of um, projects that are surrounding the site. Ed talked about the railroad and the planned Willow, Willow Ellington Jill, Willow, Willow Ellington Trail, sorry, um, that runs diagonally through this area and actually borders the northern side of the property. So we also have Old Mill Preserve, and we have Sheffield Glen, and we have Sodbuster Farm subdivisions. To the south, we have Oak Leaf, we have Woodlawn Lakes, and we have Thousand Oaks. And off to the east, we have Ancient Oaks, and we have some large lot residential subdivisions. So development trends for this area are include these numerous planned development residential neighborhoods. And in the last 25 years, this area of the county has transitioned from agricultural uses to residential subdivisions. Again, the property was originally rezoned to PDR in 1995 with approval of a general development plan in 1995 for 30 single family attached and 30 single family detached dwelling units and a golf course. The golf course was constructed and operated until approximately the mid-2000s. A new preliminary site plan was then approved in 2009 with 256 residential lots. That's substantially more than the 170 that we're requesting for now. And that consisted of 193 single-family detached residential units and 63 single-family units that were townhome style. The PSP and associated concurrency are still valid through 2018. The current PSP includes an affordable housing component, which Ed referenced earlier, to allow for that increased density. The proposed GDP reduces the density by eliminating 86 units, removing the townhouse product, removing the affordable housing component, adding an age restriction, and maintaining the conservation easements that have been recorded on the site. The property is designated Res 3 on the future land use map. This category was established with the 1989 future land use map. As you can see from this map, the areas to the north and further to the east are UF3, and the south is Res 3. The area designated PSP and SP is uh, Mills Elementary, Buffalo Creek Middle School, and Buffalo Creek Park and Golf Course. The surrounding area supports densities up to three <clears throat> dwelling units per acre. The proposed density is 1.62 dwelling units per acre, where three dwelling units per acre are allowed. We used a wetland density transfer uh, calculation as agreed to by staff and required by the Conference of Plan for our net density, and that net density is 2.08 dwelling units, where six are allowed per acre. Again, these density calculations are based on the policies of the comprehensive plan. Gross density is the number of units divided by the total acreage. Net density reduces the overall acreage when the wetlands are removed from the total acreage. Both the gross and net densities are under the allowable density in the future land use category of Res 3. 
Special approval, of course, is required for projects utilizing wetland density transfer to calculate net density. Projects adjacent to a perennial stream, which we've explained uh, is really a canal and part of a drainage system. So we've agreed to that with staff. And projects partially located within the 25-year floodplain. We're requesting the special approval and compliance with land development code and the comprehensive plan. The project is a logical expansion of the urban environment and the timing is appropriate for a clustered low moderate density urban residential project. The property was rezoned again in 1995 and the surrounding area really is a mix of residential development uh, categories. So we have RSF 1, 2, and 3, planned development residential, and we still have some portions of agriculture where we see those larger lot, uh, larger lot homes. The trend toward residential over the last 25 years continues to grow as the area develops consistent with the comprehensive plan and the future land use map. I went ahead and pulled as many of the nearby uh, subdivisions as I possibly could, and you can see it's a nice long list of, of projects that are in that general area surrounding the property. And these densities, um, the highest was 2.52. Um, again, that's allowed under Res 3. The average density in the surrounding area is about 2.16 um, when you kind of average out all of those subdivisions that are on this list. Coventry Park, again, proposes 1.62. So that's under the average in the area. So it's, it's definitely compatible with what we're seeing for development trends in that area. The comprehensive plan objectives, goals, and policies encourage a variety of housing stock in both future land use and housing elements. The housing element of the comprehensive plan contains policies that permit a variety of appropriate <clears throat> dwelling unit types and sizes. So again, these types and sizes are allowed. So you can have multiple types of residential communities abutting each other. Um, and that's allowed in all residential future land use categories. Um, and the future land use element provides requirements for strong communities, which this general development plan incorporates. The comprehensive plan provides for compatibility and mitigating measures through buffering techniques. Typically, the mitigation of adverse impacts in the comp plan is directed at non-residential to residential, not residential to residential, although the land development code does have language in it for buffers for any type of residential subdivision. So I have a color site plan here to try and um, show you everything that's going on with this site. Again, it's 170 <coughs> single family dwelling units on 105 acres in an age restricted community. So we have already recorded declarations of covenants which are in your agenda package. Of these 170 lots, the majority are planned as semi-detached dwelling units. The, there are limited single family detached units proposed um, only where the conditions exist that, that a paired villa would not fit. The single family semi-detached product is a single story paired villa. So single story paired villa is what we're proposing with this development. Um, and again, we're in compliance with section <coughs> policy 2.9.1, strong communities in mind. The project proposed is the logical progression of residential development. The project provides a 20 foot roadway buffer along Erie Road in addition to a future right of way setback. There are wetlands adjacent to the property boundaries. In these areas, a 30 foot buffer is proposed. Where project boundaries are not wetlands or wetland buffers, a 15 foot buffer is proposed. So you can see from the color site plan, we have this area to the north where we don't have wetlands and we'll propose a 15 foot wetland buffer, but only this cul-de-sac is adjacent to the northern properties. And then um, along the south, we actually have a 30 foot wetland buffer for that drainage ditch um, and then the road. So we have approximately 80 feet of buffer between the, the two projects. Um, you can see we have a lot of wetlands on this site. There's a, approximately 44.69 acres of wetlands, and we're proposing no impacts to those wetlands. The project entrance, again, is on Erie Road. It's a full access with turn lanes. Emergency access was proposed only to connect to 79th Street East here at the south. Uh, we had prepared a traffic impact statement, but because this is a general development plan, staff told us it was not necessary, but I do want to tell you that that report proposed 93 p.m. peak hour trips for this project. Uh, Manatee County staff have been good with coordinating drawings with us for the Erie Road improvements, um, and we've incorporated those into the general development plan and we'll continue to work with them to make sure that they have enough right-of-way needs for stormwater and the widening of the road. Um, I wanna mention that the transportation impact fees for this project are estimated at $930,000 for 170 units. 73.89 acres are provided as open space for a total of 70% open space where only 25% is required by code. The semi-detached product is 
proposed on a lot of 35 foot by 115 feet with a 20 foot front yard setback, a five foot side yard setback and 15 foot rear setbacks. The proposed recreational amenity is 0 0.33 acres. We have a nature trail that's gonna connect us to the Willow Ellington Trail. There are no listed species on the site according to our environmental narrative. Um, and the project is designed to meet the goals, objectives, and policies of the comprehensive plan. The property has, again, a recorded declaration of covenants and restrictions, providing that age restriction at 55 and older, and limiting the amount of time anyone under 18 can, can reside there. We had a neighborhood meeting on June 22nd. We had approximately 50 residents in attendance. Um, we worked to try and discuss all of their issues. So you see we have some more public comment. We've tried to address all of those through our presentation this morning. We've worked closely with staff throughout the process and we have a positive staff report. The project is compatible and consistent with development trends in the area and we respectfully request the Planning Commission approve this general development plan today. That concludes my presentation. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman? Yes, ma'am. I had just one comment I wanted to, to make. Mm -hmm. um, the staff was advised by our office not to view the project as age-restricted because the age restrictions are a private matter. We cannot enforce them as a county. So I'm also advised the Planning Commission not to view the project as age-restricted because we can't place any age restrictions, zoning ordinances, applicable to future residents because we can be found in violation of the Federal Fair Housing Act and the Florida Fair Housing Act. Just want to state that for record. All right, thank you, thank you. Are there uh, any questions for the applicant before we hear the staff presentation? All right, thank you. Um, we'll go to the uh, staff presentation next, please. Good morning again. I'm Tia Boyd, planner for Manatee County, and once again, I have been sworn. The request is for approval of a general development plan for 170 single-family detached and semi-detached residential units on approximately 105.909 acre site. The site is located on the west side of Erie Road, approximately 800 feet southwest of the intersection of Erie Road and 69th Street East. As stated before, the future land use category is residential three dwelling units per acre. This future land use category permits suburban or urban residential uses. Surrounding future land use categories are residential three, urban fringe three, public, semi-public, mixed use, residential six, and residential nine. This plan requires three special approvals per the Manatee County Comprehensive Plan. The special approvals include Comprehensive Plan Policy 2.3.1.1, transfer of density from wetlands and associated buffers, Comprehensive Plan Policy 3.2.2.1, a project adjacent to a perennial stream, which is the canal as shown by the applicant, and comprehensive plan policy 2.3.3.4, habitable structures within the 25-year floodplain. The site is currently zoned planned development residential, and surrounding zoning includes planned development residential, residential single family three dwelling units per acre, residential single family one dwelling unit per acre, residential single family, two dwelling units per acre, planned development commercial, general agriculture, suburban agriculture, and planned development public interest. Um, a bit about the history of the site. In 1995, the Board of County Commissioners approved PDR 9502ZP for a rezone of certain land from residential single family three dwelling units per acre to plan development residential. A general development plan to allow 30 single family detached dwelling units and a preliminary site plan to allow an 18 hole executive golf course. 
On October 2007, an administrative permit, AP 0723R, was issued allowing a cattle grazing operation on the site. The expiration for this administrative permit was extended to February 12, 2019. On October of 2009, PDR 0527P was approved by the Board of County Commissioners to allow 256 residential lots consisting of 193 lots for single-family detached residences and 63 lots for single-family attached residences. The site is currently vacant and has approximately 105.09 acres. The site is in flood zone A, AE, and X. Water and sewer are available. There is a county maintained drainage easement south of the site, which is the canal as stated before, which has been identified to be a portion of the cedar drain. And the site design proposes a non-motorized connection to the Willow Ellington Greenway Trail, which is a part of the adopted Capital Improvements Program for 2017 to 2021. Here is the general development plan for the project. The proposal is for 170 single-family detached and semi-detached residential units. The proposed design does include an amenity center. Here you can see where the wetlands are located on the site. Here are the wetland buffers, stormwater facilities, roadway buffer, and perimeter and greenbelt buffer, which is 15 feet. This is the pros proposed location of the access point from Erie Road. This is the proposed emergency access from 79th Avenue East. And this is the connection point to the Willow Ellington Greenway Trail. As stated before, there is a 15-foot greenbelt buffer to the north, south, and west of the site abutting residential dwelling units. A 20-foot roadway buffer is proposed to the east of the site abutting Erie Road, and 30-foot wetland buffers are proposed abutting all wetlands. The minimum setback proposed includes a 20-foot front yard setback for which the applicant has requested specific approval, a 5-foot side setback, 15-foot rear setback, and a 15-foot wetland setback. The proposed lot sizes are typically 4,600 square feet for the detached units and approximately 4,025 square feet for the semi-detached units. The applicant has requested several specific approvals, which includes a variable width wetland buffer, a cul-de-sac length exceeding 800 feet in length, sidewalks on one side of the road for a development within two walking miles of a school, an emergency access as a second means of access, and a 20-foot front yard setback. Here you can see the view across Erie Road looking east. Here's the view looking west across Erie Road. This is the view north from 79th Avenue East. And this is the view south from 79th Avenue East. Here's a view of Sheffield Glen, which is north of the project site and contains single family residences. Here's a view of Sodbuster Farms, which is also north of the project site. Here you can see the villages of Thousand Oaks, which is south of the site and also has single family residences. And here also site south is Woodlawn Lake subdivision with single family residences. Just west of the site and a bit north is Old Mill Preserve, which also has single family residences. And across Erie Road to the east is Ancient Oaks subdivision, which also has single family residences. This is a view of the conditions on Airy Road in the direct vicinity of the site looking north and looking south. We received several comments and concerns from the public. Some of the concerns raised include the drainage easement to the south of the site, the conditions of Airy Road, including future road improvements and potential traffic impacts, the proposed location of the emergency access on 79th Avenue East, buffering and screening for the site adjacent to the residences, and the types of dwelling and density proposed. 
There are several positive aspects to this site, a proposed design. The surrounding area is developed with single family homes and residential subdivisions. Proposed open space exceeds the required minimum 25%. A 12 foot wide nature trail is proposed to the north of the site. The nature trail will connect the site to the future parish area networks trail. Proposed growth and net density is less than the maximum required for the residential three future land use category. There were also some negatives and mitigating measures found for the site. Um, only one full mean of, means of access is proposed for residential development exceeding 100 residential units. A cul-de-sac exceeding the required minimum 800 feet is proposed within the development. A front yard setback of 20 feet is proposed, which is less than the required 25 front, foot front yard setback. I'm sorry, there's something flying around here. Um, mitigating measures includes an emergency access off 79th Street East to uh, mitigate that second means of access requirement as re in compliance with Manatee County Land Development Code Section 1001.1.C.3. A roundabout is proposed to minimize the cul-de-sac length and provide additional opportunity for turnaround and a two-foot separation is proposed between the front yard and sidewalks, thus eliminating potential for impediments to pedestrian travel along sidewalks. And as noticed before, these, have, these negative aspects have also received specific approval requests by the applicant. Staff recommends approval. Thank you, and this ends my presentation. Thank you very much. Are there any um, questions for staff? Mr. I Rutledge. just want to say that, did you put all this together? <laughs> <laughs> this is really spectacular. Um, you know, this is well presented. The graphics were great. It was very helpful, and you did a great job. I just really appreciate it very much. It, it's very clear to me what they're asking for, and so I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Horgan. I'd like to echo that same comment. This yes. is the best presentation that I've seen in four years. So very good. Good, good job. Um, I do Come back. <laughs> I do have a, I do have a couple of questions, Mr. Torgan. Has the fire district um, uh, had a chance to comment on the cul-de-sac exceeding 800 feet? Yes, and they didn't, they don't have a problem with it. Yes, the fire district did agree with the cul-de-sac length and saw that the roundabout did provide appropriate turnaround for that length. Okay, and the, the second question I have is uh, with the variable width uh, wetland buffer. Um, we just had a, a project come through that was uh, quite contentious about variable width wetland buffers. Yes, I can let the applicant speak on that. I had two questions for staff before. Uh. Um, right, um, you want me to wait? Y yes, let's wait. Um, Mr. Rutledge, let's uh, hear your question for staff. Mr. Rutledge. Uh, so I had two questions, uh, basically traffic related. So there, it's absolutely clear that there's no traffic coming on 79th, integrating this with the adjacent, uh, sorry. Uh, so 79th is only an emergency access point. It's not designed for those houses that are in the existing subdivision have access running through and adding these 100 homes to that, right? No, only emergency personnel would have access off of 79th Avenue East. And the second part of that was the access on Erie Road. So see, you only have one access onto Erie Road. Is there a traffic light there? Is it, is it deemed for a traffic light in the future? Good morning. For the record, Clark Davis, Transportation Planning Division Manager, and I've been sworn. The entrance to the subdivision is not necessarily planned for a traffic signal. Those kinds of things are often done more reactively. You know, there's a, I guess there's an assumption that when you create two, an intersection of two major roads, they're going to need some form of control eventually, and often that will be a signal or a roundabout. But for a subdivision entrance, there's no plan from day one or even expectation that there might be a signal at a location like this. So it's far from getting warrants for a light? Well, it doesn't exist, so yeah, it's way far away. <laughs> Thanks for simplifying. <laughs> uh, 
Um, any additional questions for staff, Mr. DeLesline? Can Mr. Davis talk about what's going to happen to Erie Road, the expansion and stuff? I can talk a little bit about the traffic because this uh, unusual circumstance when we get a GDP without zoning at the same time, but I'll be a little easier from the podium and document camera. Thank you. So this development, as you saw in some of the maps, is up near where the bend is from Erie north-south to Erie east-west and 69th. This is the map from your packet. And the property that's being um, requested for general development plan is this one, the blue triangular shape parcel, if you will. The county a few years ago reconfigured this intersection and it's more operational efficient now here where um, 69th comes in. It used to be a much more awkward intersection there. And so there's improvements to about right there and from there down to about here, this, this being US 301 down here, um, is the subject of a, an ongoing design for what we call a functional improvement. It wouldn't result in additional capacity for the road, but it would be a better two-lane road, be wider travel lanes with shoulders and sidewalks in the area. So it would be closer to meeting current county standards. Uh, from discussion with a project manager, there's not um, specific funding in the capital improvement program right now, uh, but they're far enough along. Maybe they'll look at a budget amendment or with next year's CIP that he basically indicated that they could be ready to construct it next year, but it's some of the funding needs to, uh, picture needs to clear up a little bit before we can go forward with it. County's also in conversation with the developer of this commercial property down here, um, right at the corner of Erie and US 301, for them to make some of their site-related and concurrency improvements on um, Erie at that 301 approach. Those um, discussions haven't reached a point of agreement yet, but there is something in the works, and if that commercial project goes forward as planned, uh, just because it's required as part of the development approval, they would be making them some improvements there. And then finally, picking up from east of the intersection, uh, running out to uh, where uh, Erie connects to 301 again in Parrish, it is also the subject of um, functional improvement design. It's a little bit farther behind the other one, but we're making similar improvements. And um, it, it'll be a, a couple more years. You may see some improvements farther to the east uh, at selected locations. Uh, it's not far enough away that it wouldn't show up on a map this scale, but maybe another mile or so east of here is where the new uh, North River High School is located. And so there'll be some improvements in that area when they construct that entrance and continue our discussions about construction of Fort Hammer. Um, in terms of the traffic volumes, um, we don't have a traffic study today. And the reason why is when um, a property is rezoned, we look at the change in uh, relative impacts, what, was cap what they were capable of doing under the old zoning and what they're capable of doing under the new zoning. Well, this was rezoned several years ago, and they've had a couple of iterations of their preliminary site plan. And until they um, submitted this application, had a valid certificate a level of service compliance, basically concurrency findings for the 256 or so dwelling units that it had. To <coughs> drop back, basically to unwind the project to the GDP level, we don't look at as creating additional traffic impacts. And so in a way, it's considered traffic neutral, or in, in this case, because of the way they're proposing their GDP, it'll actually be a traffic reduction. So you don't have an analysis in front of you today with this particular thing because there's no change in zoning and no increase in the proposed amount of development going there. With that said, though, uh, looking at the traffic volumes on uh, Erie east of 69th, um, traffic was increasing in the early 2000s, dropped quite a bit during the recession, and has been steadily climbing since then. It's roughly doubled in the past six or seven years. But even doubling, it's still under 5,000 cars a day, which is uh, well below the capacity of the road, meaning there's still a lot of capacity left on it. Our other count location in this area is on, or sorry, on Erie, just north of 301, uh, down uh, close to the intersection. Uh, where the, the drugstore and the convenience store are located. And it's more or less steadily climbed, sort of flattened out through the recession, and is around uh, eleven to 12,000 
uh, vehicles per day, which is a lot. And for people that live in the subdivisions along here, um, it probably makes it pretty hard to make left turns in and out of the subdivision from time to time. But it is still uh, below the capacity of the road, and we've got a fairly big intersection there. So it would, just speculating here, it looks likely that it would meet a concurrency test if we were doing an analysis right now. But I know that's small consolation for the people that live in subdivisions and, and have trouble making their way in and out. And some of the solution would be very long-term uh, widening of the, of the road to have a median, um, but uh, in the interim, uh, making turn lane improvements at subdivision entrances and things like that to help as well. But uh, none of those are scheduled other than what might show up with the functional improvement when it comes up. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Davis, um, does this project uh, impact the potential for uh, right-of-way acquisition along Erie Road for future expansions? Their requirement would be uh, at come at later steps in site planning, uh, but would be to uh, reserve the balance of the future right of way half width along their frontage where they abut. So, because they directly abut Erie Road, they do have some impact on future right of way needs. They would dedicate to the extent they needed to to implement their site related improvements or concurrency ones if they affected that section, but um, otherwise they would reserve a, what we call a future right-of-way setback and it would be acquired at the time we undertook a project that needed the additional land. And uh, just for clarification, this uh, GDP accommodates that setback, the future right-of-way? I'd have to look at it a little bit closer. I guess I'm operating under the assumption that it does, but I'll, okay. I'll take a look at that. All right. Thank you. Mr. Horgan. One more question for you, Clark. Um, the left turn movements out of this property, because uh, to me, not knowing the location very well, it would seem that you'd have as many left turns as you would right turns to sort of move about. Um, it, what is the what is planned to allow for that left turn movement? You know, for someone to get out into the middle and wait for traffic to pass by, or is there anything in, of that sort that's um, most of the People along this stretch of Erie Road, if they're making a left out of their subdivision, they're they're actually making it onto a two-lane undivided section. So they have to they have to count for traffic from both directions. They can't make the the so-called two-step maneuver where you look for the traffic over your left shoulder, get out in the median, and then look for the stuff over your right shoulder and go the rest of the way. So um, this uh, would likely be very similar I'd, I'd, if they uh, make a, a northbound left turn pocket to turn into the development, there may be an opportunity for them to shape the median on the other side so that they could allow for those lefts out as well. But I don't think we've seen that level of detail yet. We wouldn't expect the off-site site-related improvements to be depicted on a GDP. Okay. Thank you. And uh, to further clarify, the, the turn lanes that are shown, the left turn lanes in that are represented, that's, that's not been reviewed or um, approved either. Uh, Mr. Horgan, I know, spoke to the... Uh, the exiting movement, but the entry movements, the same applies that they haven't been reviewed or approved, that the turn lane lengths Wait, aren't. Even if we were to do our standard traffic impact statement we do for a rezoning or something like that, we wouldn't be looking at the specifics of how access points work at this time. Uh, so the, the details of <clears throat> how many left and right turners we expect and what kind of auxiliary lanes they need, it, a wouldn't have been established at this point, and in this particular case, hasn't at all. My point of clarification is the fact that they're represented in a GDP that's being approved that doesn't uh, entitle uh, the developer to these improvements. They have not yet been reviewed and approved. The turn lane links, the the <coughs> queue links. Um, th those would need further review, and mm -hmm. either at preliminary site plan or final site plan. Mm -hmm. Now that they're backing up to. General development plan. Thank you. Would that be a question for Michelle? Um, I, I don't think so. I think um, Mr. No, but, but the fact that it's represented. I, I don't know. Uh, it, Mr. Davis, I believe, indicated that it would require additional uh, review during the FSP and construction plan. There's no final site plan approval for the prior plan. Is that correct? That's my understanding. Is that they they. Stopped at adoption. Ben Davis is correct. Thank you. Okay. 
Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rhodes. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, Ms. Ms. Boyd, normally I think the county in the past has encouraged interconnectivity between various developments or communities, whatever the better term might be. But in this instant, we're happy with Erie being the main in and out with the emergency on 79, and we're not worried about the interconnectivity issue. Um, yes, in review, we found that the access on Airy Road was fine with the emergency access off of 79th East um, based on the type of development. Thank you. Any additional questions for staff? Thank you. Um, I do have a question for the applicant. It might be best answered by the, uh, the engineer. So um, if we could uh, get some clarification there several points of connection along the southern property boundary. Some are identified as, uh, let me get back to that page. Some are identified as uh, emergency, that's the one on 79th, but there are two other uh, connection points that are identified as county emergency and public utility access location. Uh, good morning, Jeb Mulock. I have been sworn CNS Engineering Engineer of Record. Uh, yes, Mr. Connolly, the those little those points are they're not access to the adjacent property. In our discussions with the fire department, they uh, as a part of the uh, cul-de-sac there, they asked for the option to uh, do some other stabilized uh, base, if you will, mm -hmm. some access. So. I don't think it's a part of this approval, but it was sort of part of our discussions with them that will land on the final site plan and construction plan. So it's it's shown there, but there's not specifics on how that'll be done yet. And um, those connect to the area that is identified as the perennial stream or canal, do they not? <clears throat> well, not it, it does to the, uh, the maintenance access. Yeah. Yeah, area. So it'll be under county's uh, access uh, easement. So that's an existing maintenance as correct. Yeah, it's yeah. access easement. Okay, and this is just a connection to allow um, county uh, staff to to access those areas for um, imp uh, maintenance, probably. Yeah, that, that's that's up. also true. Yes, yes. Okay. All right, and is it truly a an emergency connection? No, not necessarily. The roundabout was really the mitigation for for that cul-de-sac, but that was, was sort of as a secondary, um, in addition to that, if we you know if we needed to do that. But that hasn't been determined at this point. My um, point of clarification is that the, these are behind existing homes, and it's not the county's intent to utilize those for emergency access similar to the 79th no okay. no absolutely not just one connection for the uh connection or for the, the the actual true emergency access is just at 79th okay all right thank you that's that's what i was uh inquiring about yeah thank you any uh questions for the applicant i just had that one that hasn't been answered oh i'm yet. sorry um miss layton i think you were queued up to answer that question that i forgot Yes, thank you. Again, Rachel Layton, and I have been sworn. We have two areas um, where we're impacting. Oh, where did I put my graphic? Um, the, ver the, the width of the buffer, and those are to provide access. One of those um, is 90 square feet, and it will allow us to build that culvert crossing to create the emergency access to 79th Street East. And the other one is to allow for the cul-de-sac th as the mitigating measure for that extended, um, add the roundabout for the 800-foot cul-de-sac. Um, so again, those total approximately 180 square feet of impact, and we'll add buffer to replace those. So that's so it's very mu minimal. So those are the variations. Are those the are the impacts. two variations, They're yes. not, it's not for <clears throat> Um, other purposes, it's for the, um, the for the area. access, correct? And the land development code does allow for that. Thank you. Any additional questions for the applicant? I have, I have one other one. You don't think this will become some kind of attractive nuisance? This access point going across here, do you? 
No, um, with 55 and over community, we shouldn't have anyone who wants to climb into that ditch. <laughs> Just checking. You, you never know. Uh -huh. Yeah. You know, 55 is the new 25. So. <laughs> How old are you? Yeah. Right. I remember when that was. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to move on to the um, the uh, um, public comment portion of the hearing. I've got a couple speaker speaker cards. I'll um, read your name, and if you would, please come forward, state your name, <coughs> that you have been sworn, and you'll have three minutes to make a, uh, a statement. Um, the first speaker card I have is Steve Royce. If you would, please come forward. Good morning, my name is Steve Royce and I have been sworn. Good morning, commissioners, chairman. My name is Steve Royce and, and I live on property that borders Coventry Park. Thank you for the opportunity this morning to speak and provide feedback on this application. This morning I'm gonna address three areas of concern that I refer to as the three C's of Coventry. Canal, compatibility, and congestion. Let's first talk about the canal. In the documentation and reference today, the second, able, second exit is labeled as an emergency only exit over a perennial stream. In our neighborhood, the perennial stream is a term I had not heard before last week, but is referred to as the ditch or the canal. It currently is 15 foot deep and approximately 30 feet wide. When it gets dredged by the county on an annual or semi-annual basis, the depth increases to 20 or more feet. In the summertime, the canal fills up mm -hmm. and often has a swift moving current. When objects ends up in the canal, like a ball or a toy, we use ropes to repel into and out of the canal. As a dad and a person who has worked with youth for over 20 years, strangely, culverts and bridges attract youth. When the previous application for secondary access was approved in 2009 by planning and county commissioners, both access roads were designed to go off of Erie Road, despite initial drawings having a bridge or a culvert in the proposed location. The change occurred because the county planner, applicant, and neighbor boarding neighborhoods agreed that that was a workable solution and prevented unintended, unsafe situations for children for both neighborhoods, and yes, even 55 plus have grandkids. I ask for the removal of the bridge or culvert and of both at exits returned back to Erie Road in accordance with the approved plan of 2009. Compatibility. The application is for attached or semi-attached units, which is not compatible with any of the surrounding neighborhoods as mentioned today. Whether a, per a unit is called a townhome, a villa, a duplex, or a condo, it's different than a single family home, both in design and in structure. We would ask the applicant and commissioners to reconsider the choice of, of residents to align with neighboring communities. Like the current, if the current structures are approved, I would like to thank the applicant today for deciding to make them all single family residences. I mean, single family, single story homes. I also ask the applicant to consider the most westerly structure because it is closest to neighborhoods and look for the removal of that unit. Congestion. Coventry Park is another development will exit into Erie, Erie and Erie. When commissioners reviewed the project in 2009, there was great concern about the volume of traffic. The three C's I talked about today, bridge over the canal, compatibility and impact on existing congestions are serious concerns of this project. I would ask the commission, I would ask the uh, applicant and the commissioners to review these so they have the support of surrounding communities and neighbors to the border. Thank you. Thank you. M Mr. Royce, uh, just for clarification, um, given a choice between this site plan and the previous site plan, is there, do you have an opinion of? I think that I, I'm appreciative of the applicant going with the 55 plus gated community. I think that's in better in coordinates with the neighborhoods. I think the volume is good at the 170. You know, we appreciate the volume, but we're, we're asking for is returning that. Because when you build the bridge, even though it's emergency access, we have a neighborhood behind us that also has an emergency access. It's incredible the amount of cars that come through daily that have emergency access vehicles. Some of them have air conditioning, some of them look like regular cars. Uh -huh. So codes are given, people know how to get through emergency access gates. So it's a great concept, I, I, I wish that was the way it was. But the reality, we see it, and neighbors today will talk about it, that the volume that we see coming in from our, the neighborhood from behind is somewhere between 50 to 70 cars. 
that are coming through as emergency access. So my request would be, again, both locations coming off of Erie would be a very amenable solution for our neighborhood, and I would ask for the consideration for the applicant. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next speaker card I have is uh, Mr. Don Cox. If you would, please come forward, state your name, and that you have been, have been sworn. Yeah, my name's Don Cox. I have been sworn. I'm at the house next that's going to be right there. I'm at 5608 79th Avenue East. It'll be the house where the bridge goes through or the culvert. Uh, and looking at it, they said they wanted to put a culvert. I've lived there for 17 years. I've seen that ditch full where we have a pond behind. I have a pond behind my house where the pond is just about going up over to the ditch. I've seen that ditch, a culvert pipe will not allow that water to go through. You will flood my house. Who do I go to for compensation when my house gets flooded? A culvert pipe will flood my house. If they build a bridge, it'll have to be where it doesn't obstruct that ditch because I have seen that ditch full to the top with flowing water. It will impact my house. I bought my house there 17 years ago. I paid more than the asking price for the privacy of that house because it's at the dead end of the street. It was next to a golf course. I got a lake behind me. I have one neighbor. Well, he's across the street. He's across the street with <laughs> one neighbor next door. I have privacy. Now you're looking at putting a road running across the side of my house on the other side of the ditch. Yeah, that's, gonna, that's, that's kind of an issue, but I'm really worried about the culvert pipe and the water coming into my house. And I thought somebody, I'm not sure, maybe I misheard, that there was no wildlife over there. Did, did you uh, say something about wildlife? Uh, uh, if you would please direct the comments here. Um, we'll have a clarification, okay, but I, I believe. Just, I just know I got pictures of deer, hogs, bobcats, coyotes. There is a bunch of wildlife over there. We'll, we'll have the applicant yeah. um, clarify that in rebuttal, but I, I believe the uh, comment was that there were no listed species, which are Yeah, protected. and the emergency exit. There is, like you said, we have an emergency exit on the other side of us where cars come through all day. If you start getting cars coming through that, there are kids that wait for the school bus on that corner right up the street that you're, you're getting, you know, they're getting cars coming through all the time. And from back there, they'll have a run and start where right now people come down that road, make a little turn, and they're going pretty slow. But if you get a run and start from that subdivision, they might be going through there pretty fast, and them kids kind of sit on the curb waiting for the school bus. So that's it. That's all I got to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. The uh, next speaker card we have is Edward Valum. Yes, sir. If you would, please state your name and that you have been sworn. Yes, my name is Edward Vailing. Um, I have pre previously been sworn. I am also the, I'm speaking for myself today, but I am, in fact, the president of the uh, Woodland Lakes uh, Addition 2 subdivision. I live on the cul-de-sac that adjoins the gate that goes into the subdivision to the south. That was approved, and all the documentation say that that's supposed to be emergency access. In fact, it's not. It's routine access. People have the push-button clickers. If it is actually emergency access, then Federal Express and UPS have emergencies every day. Um, this is 2 o'clock in the morning. People are out there pulling up to the gate. They don't have a code. The map systems... Um, do not, Tom Tom and, and Garmin, do not show that as a non-public um, access. They, people pull up to that gate day and night trying to get through. The other concern that I have is the main entrance to this new subdivision. I don't have a scale with me but it looks as if there is only about 250 to 350 feet from the curve on Erie Road. Now, we want to talk about 55 and over. I'm 72. I plan where I go. Human nature, people are going to try to go and through that emergency access, and if there's any way that they can get a clicker to open it up, they'll go down to our subdivision to make a turn, a left-hand turn. And at some point, they're probably going to put a uh, traffic light at the main entrance to our subdivision, which will encourage people to do just that. 
we've talked uh, in the Civic Association, excuse me, Homeowners Association, and a second access off of Erie Road will help. But at any rate, that main access really needs to be further south than 250 to 350 feet from that curve because that traffic with the new high school going in, the school buses, it is really going to be difficult for people to make a left-hand turn there. We would like to, or I would like to suggest that you table this into the applicant can get some of these issues with access um, rectified. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> um, the uh, next speaker card I have is his, Henry Arsenal. If you would, please come forward and state your name and that you have been sworn. Good morning. My name is Henry Arsenault, and I have been sworn. Uh, thank you for inviting us up here today. Uh, first of all, I heard somebody say that the neighbors or uh, the community had been asked in before this for questioning or, or things that we had an interest. We never got invited in our entire street. My first notice that I received was last Friday to come to this meeting here, where other people had got this already like a month ahead of time. A couple of issues I'd like to talk about that had already been talked about. One of them is that's, that's really I'm concerned about is a culvert. We have two streams. I'm, I live on one of the lakes. I'm just a couple houses up from Dawn. We have two lakes that actually drain into that culvert. When we have a lot of rain, like he says, you got 28 feet, the water is right up the top of that 28 feet. No culvert is going to take and handle that type of water. My house will be flooded. His house will be flooded. So I have an issue with that. Uh, number two, when we talk about emergency access, on 55th Street, I sit in on, on the meeting where they said, uh, this is emergency only. We have 50 to 60 cars going through there on a regular basis every day. Every day. And when I call the Sheriff's Department, they can't do anything about it. So you can call it what you want, but it's just another access point. That's all it is. And we have a problem because, like Don said, on the corner of 79th and 55th, kids are sitting there every morning on the curb waiting for the bus. This is a corner that they'll be going. Our neighbors are, are conscious of that. We even had to, and called about the speeders. We had a sign in there that, uh, like you do at the school dorm, measures the speed. There, I don't know how many speeders they had, but they did nothing about it. Our, our speed zone in there is 20, 20 miles per hour. So I'm very concerned about the children. I'm concerned about my house being flooded. Yeah, let me see where else. Oh yeah, where's the drainage gonna run from the community here for your sewerage and like that? Is it gonna go into this culvert? Because our drainage goes into the lake. So that's additional water that's gonna be coming over into this area. So uh, you have to excuse me, I'm not a very good speaker, <laughs> but I feel very emotional about this because I'm concerned. I'm concerned about that access it should go back out to Erie Road. Two of them should be going back out to Erie Road. Uh, thank you for your time today. Mr. Arsenal, I'm a little confused. You said there's currently cars going through the emergency access. Are you referring to the 79th Avenue connection? On 55th Street. The new, the, about, the how, long, how long ago the was south that? South side. Oak Leaf, yeah. They come down through there on 55th Street all the time. Okay. We go into 55th Street. Uh, if you come from our house, to 55th Street, that's the corner, and then they come down 55th and go out onto the Erie Road. Okay. But that's another emergency exit that really isn't an emergency exit. It's just another access point. And we those don't cars, have right, excuse me. Those cars that are coming through that area you're speaking of, those are folks from your community? No, those are people from the community in back of us, which is another private road area. Mm -hmm. It's gated. We can't go in there, but they can come through all the time. And like I say, I guess at UPS, and I guess about 70, well, at least 50 people per day coming from that area, which are just residents, are all emergencies, I guess. Because, and you can't do anything about it because the Sheriff's Department says we don't, uh, we don't handle that. If you could get Mr. Davis. It, please, you can't, you can't provide testimony from the audience. No, we can't have it. Um, the... Uh, <laughs> um, 
the question that I would have, which I'm going to ask staff, uh, is is that actually an emergency access or is it just a gated road? So we'll get clarification on that. So yeah, if it's, if it's not an emergency exit, that means that they've changed it from the original proposal right. that's sitting in front of this board. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Those were all the speaker cards I had. Is there anybody else who wishes to come forward and, and speak on this matter? Uh, if you would, just please come forward, state your name, and that you have been sworn. May I say something? Uh, we, we've already had you speak. I think we know the issues. I, I don't know that anything could be added. We're shutting that down. Um, anybody else? Mr. Chair, yes. you have to allow citizens, if I have to ask questions, who the chair or staff, it appears that the citizens are asking after questions. They've already, um, well, they may not have understood that, and I would allow due process. If the citizen wants to lay a question on the table directed to you, and we can have staff answer it, then he can do so. Okay. All right. Thank you for the clarification. If you would, please, again, state your name and that you have been sworn. Yes, Edward Vailing, um, would it be possible to see Mr. Davis's map again? Yes. Yes, we'll do that. And for clarification, staff is always available to answer questions. Yes, I mean, that they are. probably answer your question about where uh, Mr. Arsenault's uh, right. entrance is. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, again, last opportunity before we close the public citizen comment. Is there anything else that uh, anybody would wish to say? Okay, seeing nothing, um, we're going to go ahead, or seeing no one come forward, we're going to go ahead and close the uh, public comment portion. And uh, if I could get clarification, Mr. Davis, do you understand the question um, that we're asking? Is that a private road that has a gated access, or is it truly an emergency uh, a, a entrance identified as an emergency access? Um, It'll take me a couple minutes to, to see if we can research that while we're here. Um, but the maps that you have, or that I put on the document camera earlier, is from the, the packet. So everyone should have access to this that uh, has been able to look at it online. Um, this shows the, the subdivision, or not subdivision, the property that's being considered and the subdivisions to the south. And so you've received testimony from residents that live here at this dead end where it's going to provide the cross connection and also from residents that are concerned about this cross connection to, um, I believe it's Oak Leaf Hammock to the west. Um, it'll take us a couple minutes to take a look at that if you've got other questions for folks. We'll okay, thank you. And I, I guess the... Uh, um, the point that needs to be made is we're reviewing the application for the property to only to the pro only the property to the north. Um, there's been uh, a condition proffered that would limit the access to emergency <clears throat> access only. Um, if maybe Tom or Clark, if you could please um, provide some clarity with regard to how that access is limited. In my experience. If it's an emergency access, typically they have something like a knox box. And so, so if you could provide some clarity, I, I don't think it's going to be a clicker type of uh, situation. <clears throat> Mr. Chair, for the record, Thomas Grossmerger, Public Works Department, I've been sworn. As typical for any emergency access point, uh, it's typically controlled through either a uh, swing arm or a uh, automatic gate. And typically, the means of operation of that particular um, gated access point would be through an emergency transponder activation. Mm -hmm. And those those are specific to emergency services, correct? Correct. Yes. So. <clears throat> All right, uh, Mr. Rhodes. Yeah, Tom, just a follow up. So, if that's the way it was set up, isn't it the community's responsibility to enforce? those regulations and not see the abuse that these residents are talking about, that doesn't fall on the county, does it, to monitor a emergency area exit or entrance that isn't being used for that? Well, to dovetail to Mr. Uh, Rhodes' comment, um, could you provide clarity with regard to the roads, um, the community to the south, the um, the public nature of those roadways versus the private nature of those roadways? With respect to Oak Leaf Hammock or uh, Woodlawn, Thousand Oaks? I'm trying to get to the, the area. Question whether 79, 79, yeah. 
you know, are these <clears throat> the same conditions? Because they're describing something that doesn't sound very tenable to me. And is that the same thing they're going to expect on the north side? Is that – I'm a simplifier. I got to – you know, do we have the same condition going to be repeated on the north side? Uh, Commissioner Rutledge, um, the intent of this access point between this particular project and Thousand Oaks and Woodlawn is specifically for emergency access. It's not as a means of full access. Actually, staff initially was seeking full access to the, from this project to the south. And based upon the uh, neighborhood meeting that was held by the applicant and actually there is a letter that's included in staff report. It's actually page 86 of the staff report from the Thousand Oaks Homeowners Association that they were in support of emergency access. So this, that is why specifically 70, the access point to 79th Avenue is for emergency access vehicles only. <clears throat> Now, as far as enforcement, obviously there would be the means through the HOA documentation as far as who has access to the private streets within a uh, gated community or not. But I would say those would fall under the privy of the HOA association and not to say the sheriff who was brought up earlier. Um, as far as access to the subdivision itself, the primary access point is off Erie Road is a boulevard entrance. Um, I think what um, Clark was alluding to as well, as at a general development plan stage, we have not looked at traffic analysis operation and of this study. So as far as the intent for this general development plan, the intent of this general development plan is for the primary access, full access for this project to be from Erie Road. One other thing I'd point out, and comparison to the previous preliminary site plan, the secondary access point that was provided out to Erie Road would have consisted of wetland buffer impacts crossing between two wetland areas. So that is something to consider as far as another access point out to Erie Road, and especially with this project, the multiple acres of wetlands that are associated with this project as rationale why a secondary access point to area road was not provided on this general development plan. And um, Mr. Gersenberger, just to um, clarify something you said, um, 79th is a public right of way. Correct. Should the applicant desire to connect to 79th without a gate, the county would allow it because it is a public right of way. It is correct. It is public right away. The county cannot um, restrict access if if all other conditions are met, the drainage and roadway section to 79th. Is that correct? That is correct, sir. So, so the fact that it's being gated actually limits the folks from the south accessing the property to the north. And I would also say vice versa, the access from the north to the south. With the, with the uh, condition that it be emergency only. Correct. So, yes. Okay. Uh, Mr. Horgan, I believe was. Um, there's not going to be a CDD on this project, is there? Is that proposed? I don't know that that's known at this point. Well, because that makes a big difference between whether it's a public street or it's a uh, private street. Not necessarily, but that I think that issue gets a little uh, convoluted. But I would, I, would, I would agree that with the gate there, it actually makes it a better opportunity for the neighbors to the south. And the east-west connection there, where we're talking about the area that's supposedly gated and, and people are having access, are, is that street public on both sides? I'm, I'm sorry, we were looking at this plan sheet. Which road were we talking about? Yeah, the, 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 one, the one road where, and I, I can't tell what the... Can you the, tell us the road name? The name or number is. Yeah, that, it. we don't have anything that labels those roads away. Um, this right. is 55th. Right there. And then there's another cross connection to Oakleaf Hammock down here. Um, all of Oakleaf is private. The majority of th these two subdivisions are public. There's a couple of, of little, um, a cul-de-sac on this side and a little loop road on this side that are private, but the balance of it is public. And um, 
it appears that these are transponder activated gates at these locations, what the requirement was there for those in terms of emergency access and so forth. We just haven't had time yet to pull up out of development orders and whatnot, mm -hmm. but that's, that's the way it looks. So it is private on the other side of those gates from where the residents that have been addressing you today are speaking but about. It would not be common for people to have the transponder code in their button on their car to sort of drive through these things, correct? Um, I, well, you would hope not and think not, but we've, we've run into similar issues. There's some portions down near um, Mill Creek and Greyhawk area where there's some private uh, sections and with similar connections and we've, we've seen the same issues. So the very things that they've talked about today where, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, wayfinding map providers and things like that just show them as connections and delivery people and some of the residents will end up using them, how they get access to the transponders. Well, I don't know, but Mr. it happens. Mr. Davis, could you make the distinction? You mentioned that they're transponder activated they, they appear to be transponder activated gates. That doesn't mean they're emergency access only, correct? It, it means it's a private. It means it's room. private. Right. Um, they may or may not be emergency, and that's what we don't know right If it's now, a but private access, it's likely to be an emergency access also, but if it's an emergency access only, it's not likely to be. <laughs> we, um, well, uh, every access is a potential emergency access of some sort. The question is whether it's, uh, you know, restricted to emergency activity right. only or not. And so the private versus non-private doesn't tell you whether it's restricted to emergency only. The re recollection of the residents is that when Oak Leaf Hammock was approved that it was to be emergency access. I don't have any reason to, to doubt that, but we haven't verified it either. Right. I think that would be a, a point of clarity. Um, we'll, we'll seek input from the applicant, but uh, that... That may be a point of clarity that would be important if uh, this goes on to the board. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Um, Mr. Ray. <coughs> just, just to comment on that, the community that I live in, we do have an emergency exit, as we're talking about today. And I could tell you it is not abused uh, by what's being used. So I can see your irritation. If that was the purpose and that's the way it was sold on what is happening here, but I think it is up to the communities to enforce it. And um, one of the gentlemen, Mr. Vallon, I think, mentioned that he was also an HOA president. Um, and I think it's up to you to, to talk to the communities and enforce them. But I don't think we, it's fair to the future developer to say the sins of these communities are imposed on his community because uh, it is an abuse. I think it's wrong if that's what they're doing, but I happen to live in an area where it is being followed as the, uh, the stipulation stated many years ago. Mr. Rutledge. Yeah, I, I don't think there's disagreement. I, and I would ask Mr. Vogel to comment, but I don't think there's disagreement that the applicant's not asking for what you are describing is occurring. They're asking for what the emergency response teams think they need. I think, this is my question about the culvert and the nuisance and all that, is that how you design it and the details of that and how inviting you make it is a huge impact on what's done. And whether you give out, and I've been on boards, if you give it out to Bob and he gives it to his brother-in-law and they go through there, it starts this whole thing. And then he's buddies with a UPS guy who's a friend of mine from Amazon. He, he gets it. So I would, I would ask, because I don't think the intent is to have what you have at these other spots at this location. And if they would warrant that and design it and help us with that, I would be much more comfortable because I, I'm telling you, I, I get your thing where all the kids are running and they're getting through and somebody's too lazy to drive around. And it's always the guy you don't like, right? It's not your best friend that's doing it. So I would wonder whether the design could be such. And I think the difference is whether it's a gate or an arm or how difficult it is to get through are all very significant parts of how this is exercised. And I think that's the question here. I think what you said is exactly right. They can work or they cannot work. And I'd like to know with some clarity how... I would trust the staff to give us a good solution, but I'd like to know that <clears throat> Mr. Vogel is comfortable saying he's going to try and keep it to be exactly what he asked for. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any other questions for staff? Yes, one other question. Mr. Rhodes. Not related to the uh, in and outs. 
Uh, Mr. Gertzenberger, there was a comment made by Mr. Cox who was talking about his residence and that the potential uh, piping related to the canal and that kind of thing is going to flood his home. And then another gentleman said that he have, his residence may also be flooded. Can you address the canal, the related pipe and flooding, real or imagined? And uh, again, to dovetail in on Mr. Rhodes' question, could you just speak in general terms regarding what the requirement is with regard to the stormwater management and make it a, a broader, so the not necessarily these specific neighbors, but anybody that may be bordered along Remember, there. the answer is it'll get better or it'll get worse. <laughs> <laughs> or it'll stay the same. <laughs> Zoom out a little bit, please. <coughs> Mr. Chair, fellow commissioners, um, I wanted to start with the uh, larger picture, looking at it from the watershed vantage point, and then scale down to the uh, project itself. The uh, map exhibit shown, um, the area bounded in red is the Buffalo Canal Frog Creek watershed. And where the pin is pointing and identified in the uh, yellow is the uh, particular project we're speaking of today, Coventry Park. With respect to, let's see if I can get both of the, camp, the uh, microphones to pick me up. With respect to Coventry Park and the adjacent uh, communities in this area, whether it be Woodlawn, Thousand Oaks, Old Mill Preserve, Sheffield Glen, they all drain into, as we spoke about before, Cedar Drain, which is a tributary of uh, Buffalo Canal, which drains, first drains off um, Erie Road to the west and makes a 90 degree turn at the southwest corner of Coventry Park, this particular project in question, and also the location of the um, railroad track crossing. And then from that point turns, turns north, and then, excuse me, northwest, and eventually drains into Buffalo Canal up near what is known as, um, excuse me, what is um, identified as at that point at Fish Farm Road and also Moran Road. From there, the uh, drainage from Cedar Drain and Buffalo Canal drain westerly and eventually, um, just a little bit of name terminology, Buffalo Canal eventually um, becomes part of the Frog Creek system where the canal can, um, connect together at I-275 and then from there proceed further to the west. This particular watershed in question, the Buffalo Canal Frog Creek watershed, is associated with a uh, watershed management plan that was um, provided by both Mancy County and Southwest Florida Water Management District. And there is extensive uh, modeling that is available of this particular watershed. The modeling and subsequent 100-year uh, floodplain delineation of this watershed were incorporated into the 2014 flood insurance rate maps. So this particular project is required to provide uh, floodplain mitigation for floodplain impacts within the 100-year and also the 25-year <coughs> floodplain. And this particular project is also <coughs> required to reduce the uh, post-development uh, discharge rate by 50% as compared to the allowable pre-development condition. So the, uh, the points of connection to the existing system are going to be maintained or are they being moved? Yes, the points of connection into Cedar Drain are being maintained. Um, there was actually 
a component of a stormwater management system that was associated with the previous golf course that used to be located on this particular property, which those existing outfall points are being utilized for discharge into Cedar Drain. So if the uh, points of connection are being maintained and there's a 50% reduction in the peak rate of discharge, <clears throat> what's the ex expectation? Is it, to Mr. Uh, Rutledge's point, <laughs> is it going to provide an improvement to the uh, watershed with regard to um, the attenuation? Or is it going to have a negative effect, which has, I think, been expressed as a concern amongst the neighbors? Mr. Chair, um, there was actually some revision to uh, one of the stormwater stipulations with respect to the uh, flood plain impacts with this particular project. And for clarification, the intent is for this project not to create any adverse impacts to surrounding sub subdivisions or sur surrounding properties adjacent to this property. Okay, thank you. Uh, one other question. Mr. Rutledge. Good morning. Good morning. Um, and so when you start to do this work on the culvert and it's going to impact this canal or whatever we're to call this body of water that's transmitting this, are there going to be some modifications in that? In other words, will, my experience is they don't just go put the culvert in there. They dig around, they deepen it, they make it more... Uh, a higher performance standard. Would you expect that to occur? <clears throat> Commissioner Rutledge, as part of the final site plan construction plan submittal, uh, the package would also include drainage modeling analysis, which would utilize the uh, available watershed data that was included from the um, overall study of this particular area. Um, one thing I'd like to note, and actually, as comparison, this particular picture here is just located, if I can bring the map up in comparison too. So what you are looking at here is the railroad crossing bridge, or excuse me, not bridge, culvert. The uh, culvert crossing at the, for the railroad tracks, um, that particular culvert um, being um, a corrugated metal pipe. And then further downstream being the crossing and old mill preserve, and in this case it would be a concrete arch culvert. That would be part of the analysis that would be proceeding um, public hearing general development plan included with the final site plan construction plan analysis to take a look at the not only culverts downstream, which I'm showing in these pictures, but also to take a look at the culverts and what drainage is um, draining into cedar drain from Erie Road as well. So again, kind of simplifying it for, for me. Usually when we go in and impact these areas, we don't go back and do what we did 50 years ago, which is dig a trench, stick a culvert in there. There's there's uh, flow analysis done, there's mm -hmm. design criteria done, you've got current modeling. When you say it's, it's in the 14th, is that recent modeling so that they've got watershed? Because obviously that's all changed and very significant to insurance rates and all these other things everybody's impacted by. So when we finish what we're expecting to see from this development, it'll be better. Um, Commissioner, as I, <laughs> as like, I, to I like to say, you may not say that, but, but I would be comfortable in saying that, correct? Commissioner, as I would like to say, um, condition, conditions will not be created that would be any worse. They would be they would be providing through the final site plan construction plan, subsequent drainage calculations that they are not making the conditions any worse in this particular area on Cedar Drain with respect to, and I'll bring up this exhibit because of what's included on the exhibit, which are all these little stage points. All those little stage points are all analysis points. Okay. So, and as part of that drainage modeling, they are to demonstrate that none of those stages that are identified with any of those points are causing any increases. Because that would be causing adverse impacts. <clears throat> Worse. 
Correct. Right. Uh, and, and the other thing I, I think is important to note, when I look at these site plans, the, the, the way the golf course was left to be whatever it is doesn't have the same performance standard for water distribution as the new design will have. And if I was an engineer, I might know how to say that. But what we expect is this is going to be a much more efficient piece of property and not put as much, uh, reduced by 50%, I think you like to say, mm -hmm. uh, the amount of water that would go into that drainage ditch. So although maybe we don't like development, the truth is it brings us up to a current standard that we maybe wasn't in place at the time. Correct? Yes, that would be correct. Thank you. Check. <laughs> Mr. Horgan. Yeah, I just dovetail on that. I think you answered my, my, my question, but post-development, there will be less water coming off of this site than pre-development. The runoff. The runoff. The discharge will be discharge less. discharge will yes. be less than. Yes, than correct. Yes. Um, I know the answer. You know the answer. I'm sure Jeb knows the answer. But uh, what happens to the other 50% of that water? It is, that is part of the rationale for the on-site stormwater retention ponds is to attenuate, to provide storage for the additional amount of discharge, the additional amount of runoff that is captured post-development and contained within the stormwater facilities. So it's held on-site. Correct. All right. Any additional questions for staff? Thanks. Thank you. Any, uh, any more clarification needed on any of these before you ask the applicant to uh, step forward? Mr. Chairman, oh, yes, I want to point out, in the past when there's been an issue with these gates, we always attach a stipulation. I can read one to the record just so the applicant address where they want to agree to it. Mm -hmm. We've said that the paved emergency access onto 79th Avenue East, as depicted on the, preliminary, on the general development plan, shall provide <coughs> automatic security gates, with remote control access system in accordance with Section 228.2 County Code of Ordinances. And we have a county code that addresses the transponder issue and all this, mm -hmm. and it's enforceable through code enforcement citation form. So this requires it to be only emergency access and have a certain type of transponder. Mm -hmm. Right. It's designed for emergency access. Right. We can't regulate who gets the codes, but... Right, and as best we can do. I, I think the clarity needs to be made between the the difference between a private road access, which only the residents of that community, versus a emergency access, which gives the county emergency services the right to access. Correct. So, and um, you said that that the applicant needs to make the statement that well, that's acceptable. If, if they agreeable to that stipulation, right? And that's because they're giving up the right to the public right away. Well, they've. They've stayed in their site plan, mm -hmm. but right. we're proposing stipulation, and for the record, they have to say whether they agree or not. Okay. May I ask one other question of Mr. Davis? Sure. Mr. Davis. Mr. Davis, good morning. I had a question about the 55 and older. Is there any The, uh, the 55 and older that we're not considering? Let me restate that. Uh, in a community where we would have 55 and older, is there traffic analysis about the amount of traffic that that would generate versus a more traditional neighborhood? Because my assumption is in some communities, they give that a, a lower expectation number of cars, no, not, no children, et cetera, and so there's a different impact. We, for purposes of doing traffic analysis, use uh, the Institute of Transportation Engineers Trip Generation Manual. It is a compilation of studies done past three or four decades of different types of developments. They do differentiate between different types of residential development. So there are studies of just single family detached, your general sort of non-age restricted communities. There's age restricted communities. There's planned unit developments with a mix of small and large unit types and apartments and so on. So. Um, if there are appropriate restrictions either imposed or proposed at the time they come in for uh, subsequent site planning steps, we can take that into consideration. And if, for, in this case, if this were to go forward and continue as they've discussed as an age-restricted community, we would expect it to have lower trip generation by virtue of the very things you talked about, the, the demographics basically of the community, lower, um, lower persons per household, lower vehicle ownership, and so forth that tend to generate less trips. <clears throat> Excuse me. So in following um, the canal, 
um, the congestion and compatibility. Um, I think I understand. So we don't we, we can't today make any comment about what the trip generation will be because we don't have an absolute certainty about this quote age restriction. But there's there's clearly a benefit to the residents to know that that would be part of it if that were part of the representation by the applicant. Um, I don't have anything else to add. You know, if, they, if it goes, comes forward as an age-restricted community with less units than they had before when it was not, then we would expect the trip generation to be quite a bit less. They've proposed about two-thirds of the number of units, but as the way they've discussed that they will submit it, we'll probably have half the trip generation of the, the prior approved PSP. And I think for our purposes, the applicants proffered the age-restricted community. Um, there's mechanisms in place for review with regard to the traffic, but the county is not going to require or stipulate that it be age restricted. Is that correct, Ms. Shank? Okay, right. thank you. Mr. Horgan. I guess my only comment would be um, that regardless of whether it was age restricted or not, there is a capacity on the road right. yeah, yeah. to handle the traffic. The numbers I provided earlier were based on the traffic counts through 2016. There are some approved but not yet built developments in the area, so there's capacity based on the, the most recent counts we've seen. What I don't have with me today are the reserve trip volumes, but that would be taken into account when they come in with their final site. But either way, it wouldn't make any difference whether it was age-restricted or it wasn't age-restricted. Assuming for our purposes here today it's not age-restricted, it's just approved as a um, a, a development of this number of properties, there is the capacity today to handle it. Yes. Thank you. And um, one last point on the traffic. Um, does the current analysis consider the impact of the future high school? The most recent analysis would have been with the PSP that's now adopted, which is a few years old. It would not have considered the high school because it would not have been even contemplated in, no, in any I'm, concrete terms at the no, time. Not, not for this application in, uh, in particular. You mentioned the, the information you have regarding the system, the, the uh, capacity of the existing system. The numbers I provided were our average annual daily traffic count. So is it just current okay. volumes, if you will? Uh, current volumes, not not any projected volumes. Things, so right, didn't include the potential impacts of constructing the high school. When um, this um, comes forward as a FSP or construction plan level uh, application, would they be required to consider the impact of the future high school on the roadway system? Yeah. The, the, they had a, they have a PSP with an approved certificate of level of service. This development is at such a scale, it's not eligible for a certificate of level of service at the GDP level. So it, it essentially their CLOS gets rescinded if this GDP is approved. They'll have to come in and do traffic analysis again, and at that time they'll have to consider all approved of, but not yet built developments over and above what's on the ground already. And in this case, that would include the high school because it's it's an active, it, it's going. And my, my point is it's not just the trips on the road today, it's the projected trips that have to be um, considered with the addition of this community if it were to be built. Yes, it, it, okay. people that live in the area know. I mean, the, the commercial development I was talking about earlier down at Erian 301, the most recently uh, approved DRI a little bit east of here on the north side of Erie and, and so on. So there's there are things that are coming that would also be included in that traffic <coughs> analysis. Thank you, thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. Question? Sure. Um, this is no, welcome. Uh, when you look at this site plan and you look at the wetlands and the way they've addressed it, do you think they've done a good job at, at saving as much wetlands as they can? I mean, do you think this is a good plan? Good plan. Oh, okay. <laughs> Robert Knabel, um, Director of uh, Environmental Planning <coughs> Section, and I've been sworn. Um, I think it meets the code, and I think they have, looks to me like they've done a good job from what I can tell right now, and I can let uh, Dorothy, since she's more familiar with it, uh, give her this one. Um, actually, uh, Dorothy Rainey, Environmental Review, I've been sworn, and um, there's already uh, conservation easements over all the wetlands and the wetland buffers on this site. 
um, they may be requesting a vacation of a tiny segment to allow the emergency access to cross the conservation easement. Mm -hmm. um, so they've, they're, as far as I know, they don't intend to lessen the coverage of the easement anywhere else except for, for that access. Um, there may be, um, I'm not sure if I, if I interpreted it correctly, but there, there may be other occasions where a slight um, encroachment into the buffer may be necessary in order to allow um, access to a, you know, in between wetlands um, to get to the rest of the upland portions to develop and, you know, to get access to it. But um, I don't, it doesn't show anything on this general development plan in the way of additional uh, buffer impacts to the wetland buffers. Um, so, so yeah, they, um, they've basically left everything intact that was originally preserved. Okay. Okay. Or this is the other answer. They left it. It's it's the same. <laughs> yes. Okay, got it. All right. Any additional questions for staff? Are there any questions for the applicant? Okay. Um, I just wanted to ask Mr. Vogel because I love to hear him present. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if he would like to make a comment about this access point, it seems to be a very hot topic. It seems like something I think you could resolve. Well, we're going to respond to all of those points in the rebuttal. So if, if now's the time, I'll do it. Um, let's uh, see if there are any staff closing comments to, Sorry. to see if um, there's additional items for rebuttal. Are there any staff closing comments? Ms. Boyd? Tia Boy, planner, and I have been sworn. Um, I do have some additional citizen comments that were um, sent that need to be submitted in the record. Are these the uh, comments that were provided earlier? Yes. Okay, all yes. right. So I just want to make sure we had that for the record. Okay, thank you. And I don't have anything else. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Vogler, your rebuttal, please. Yes, Ed Vogler, I have been sworn, and I want to thank you. A lot of excellent questions. We get a little antsy sitting in the audience because we'd like to answer them too, but I think you got uh, most of the answers, and I just want to reshape and make sure that we're communicating completely. We have an existing approved project with a PSP and a CLOS. We have satisfied transportation, right? We build that project. So let me take you behind the scenes of the developer's thought process. I say, well, wait a minute. We're now coming forward to give up those vested rights, and we're asking for a general development plan when we can't satisfy transportation right now, right? Why would we take that risk? Why would we take that risk? Well, you've heard the answer shaped differently by various people, but the answer is, because we're substantially reducing the density, we're changing the unit type, and we're making a commitment for a different age category, which can reduce the traffic generation by half. The risk profile on traffic on this plan is zero. We've got a vested right for more, and we're doing substantially less. So um, that's important to understand. Second thing about access, as it will go forward, there will be a middle northbound left turn lane into the subdivision, and there will be a southbound deceleration lane that provides um, refuge. Not for the left out of the subdivision, but just normal. You see this all the time on the two lane roads. The developer has to come in at their project entrance, they taper it out, and they taper it back in, and inside that bubble is turn lanes. And that's appropriate, wise, expected, intended. I'd like to talk a little bit about the Oak Leaf subdivision, the 55th Avenue. Um, I've interviewed people that live there, so I'm confident that what I'm telling you is right. That was an RSF2, straight zoning category, which means it was not planned development which means it did not come through this board or the Board of County Commissioners, more likely than not. And the information that I have been told is that the, there are private roads there and there is a gate, but it is not an emergency access commitment. Now, I say to my friends here, if it is an emergency access commitment and you can find that, then you go to the Code Enforcement Office of Manatee County, not the Sheriff. And the code enforcement people will enforce that. 
if that's a stipulation. Number two, you can take your association's attorney and enforce a, a government-imposed stipulation either through the government process code enforcement or through private process, which you have every right to do. I fear, because it was straight rezoning and not a planned development, that there is no such commitment and that you're not correct about that. But nevertheless, on ours, which you've heard the testimony again, but I want to <coughs> reframe this. Ours is going to be emergency access only. Residents will not be provided a code, will not be provided a clicker. What I'm told about that ordinance that Ms. Shank mentioned is that the emergency management officials, primarily fire, maybe sheriff, okay, they actually set the codes, all right? They, they don't give them to us. They set it up at the end. So when we say emergency access on our project, we mean it. What the other folks did and what they said to you, I don't know. But we mean it, and it will be performed that way, period. End of story. Now, on the 55 plus, I recognize I'm not asking you to review it for that purpose. I heard the county attorney. That's right. But I have to tell you a factual statement. <clears throat> there is today recorded against this property in the public records an age restriction limiting to essentially 55 plus, recorded today. And it cannot be released cannot. So that's just a true statement. It should give you some comfort, I think, and that's why I wanted to say it. Um, you heard the, the testimony from your own staff about uh, two access points on Erie. They don't want it. Doesn't, the alignment uh, doesn't work. It's going to have significant wetland impacts. I told you how we're improving that road, and there's going to be a uh, right-of-way uh, setback for future right-of-way expansion of, of, of Erie. Um, Mr. Rutledge, I am also a simple man, and um, I'm also not an engineer, so I, I mean, th these engineers get nervous about how they talk about things, you know. But I, I do want to just say something. In our own mind, the culvert that will be installed will have more capacity for water transmission than what exists today, okay. or it doesn't get approved, right? Now, I'm sure there's a lot of engineering science that goes along with that. I'd need a couple of more minutes if you don't Go ahead, please. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of engineering and science and technical reviews that will go along with that, but in the simplest way, it has to be so. And so, and I've heard your staff essentially say that as well, and not those words. Um, there are no listed species on this property. That doesn't mean there's no wildlife. And um, we do have an expert here that could testify to that. I heard only one comment and not, we don't say there's no wildlife. There's no listed species like eagle uh, or some other protected species. And finally, I, I wanted to take just a minute and, and tell you about um, University Park, for example. Uh, we've studied the traffic at University Park for 20 plus years. It's, a, it's not a 55 and older community, but it has developed in a way that the homeowners there are older. And those traffic studies that we do under our DRI every year demonstrate less than 50% generation from people that are older in these communities. I mean, it's actually very interesting and staggering. So the 55 plus year that cannot be rescinded is an important element of this. And uh, we, we intend to be and will be great neighbors. And this, this project will be a benefit to the community. Thank you. All right. Um, Let's move on to deliberation. Uh, one, one of the things that I think was beneficial in the rebuttal is the clarification between a private road and emergency access. So you heard uh, the applicant make the clarification that the intent here is that it be an emergency access and not a private road. I think that there was a lot of discussion on that, so I appreciate that uh, statement of clarity. Um, and I, the way I view it is they're giving up the right to that public right of way. So that, that's, I think, one of the things we heard a lot of discussion about it. Are there any other uh, elements with regard to this application that need to be discussed <coughs> during the uh, deliberation? Well, I just want to comment on the, the outline that you gave me. Thanks. It is good guidance. I, I do think the issue about the water is very significant because we're, we're, we're changing from the old days when, you know, my dad's farmer friends just dug a hole and the water went through and it was okay until it got too wet, you know, and then they dug another trench. So 
I appreciate that, and I think that's something I'm, I'm grasping better as we go along. We have more science than we used to, so I'm appreciative of the flooding issue. Um, I do think there's a, there's a real change, I think, culturally about traveling. And though traffic's a big issue, what we're finding is where people are collective and they have services, so everybody's going to go south because all the services are south of this. You know, to go north on Erie Road is a trip that you're making, but the, the velocity of traffic at 11,000 at the south end and 5,000 to the north shows you they're going to Publix and CVS and the gas station and all that. And I do think the convenience of this is not out of range. So I think the traffic issue is always something here for us in Florida, but I think the, 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 the right turn, the access that you need more than most things is really probably appropriate. You know, so I'm not as concerned about that going left and up into Erie Road to go kind of out to the green space. So I think you've done a, a pretty good job from what was potentially going to be there. And I think with a, a good developer, they'll address this access thing because they don't want it either. They don't want people going the other way as much as you don't want them there. And I, I, I know that those things are sensitive and you have to kind of have some trust in it. But I trust our staff because I think they're very good at uh, – I wouldn't say extracting, but obtaining the appropriate kind of finish when these things are done. So I'm, I'm pretty pleased, and I appreciate very much you all coming in and helping us understand what the issues were, because I think that was helpful for me. So thank you for that. Thank you. Any other uh, points of deliberation? And um, Mr. Rutledge, I think one of the things that um, is becoming more evident uh, as we look at some of these uh, communities that have matured um, is that the um, the way communities are required to develop, they're required to provide um, stormwater facilities. Yeah. And um, we had a we had two storms recently, and um, the the storms affected some areas of the county. Um, I've done a little bit of research, and it seems apparent that the ones that were affected were older communities. The newer rules um, have evolved in a manner such that it. It, it tends to benefit. It's not an obligation to benefit a neighbor, but it just by just by uh, the fact that a system is constructed, there's a benefit. Um, it there are probably instances where that's not the case, but um, I, we hear it on almost every application that the stormwater uh, is a concern, traffic's a concern. Those are the two things we we deal with very frequently, and um, I think. The traffic is similar to a, uh, a water system, a, a, like a, a pressure water system. The more network elements you build, the more roads you build, the more options you're going to give people, and it's going to improve it. Um, at, at today, um, er, um, is it Erie Road or 301? May not may not be the best option for many folks, but as it evolves, it'll become a better option and it'll pro provide more uh, more usable ac um, points of access. So it'll just benefit the community overall as these things are developed, not necessarily this applicant, but um, the uh, uh, existing communities also. So um, anything else, Mr. Mr. Horgan? Um, not on this deliberation, but I only have one, one more comment. Is it Ms. Boyd, whatever you do with your presentations, would you please share it with everybody else in the department? <laughs> Class has started at 11. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It makes our job a whole lot easier. Thank you. All right. Um, if there's no other deliberations, the chair will consider a, uh, a motion. And, Mr. Chair, any motion to approve should refer to the new stipulation on drainage and C2 that was in the update memo? And also, should we, to, should we refer to the new stipulation A3, read to the record by the county attorney regarding the emergency access? A3 and C2. Could, could, Ms. Chen, could you give us a motion? Well, it would be, if you're moving to approve, it would be the recommended motion and your agenda materials, including the revised stipulation C1 through C4, with that C2 on drainage and update memo included, and the addition of a new stipulation A3, read to the record by the county attorney regarding the emergency access on 79th Avenue East to the gate. I'll make that motion as stated. <laughs> I'll second. Uh, we have a motion by Mr. Horrigan, a second by Mr. Williams. <coughs> Is there any additional discussion or deliberation? Seeing none, the chair is going to call the matter to vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 
Those opposed, like sign. The chair votes aye. The motion passes 5-0. Right. Um, I believe that concludes our um, agenda today. Uh, just one question for staff. Um, Mr. Gerstenberger, we had spoke previously about having maybe a, a workshop or something where we could have a discussion relevant to the uh, stormwater facilities that are required for development. Has there been any um, opportunity to maybe schedule that in the, the coming year? Mr. Chair, I think given the uh, recent um, election of uh, Kind of uh, planning commissioners that we just went through for Mr. Horgan, and I mm -hmm. believe uh, Mr. Boyd, who will be joining us in uh, December, that we were looking at that time frame or into January as far as providing that work session on stormwater. Okay, I think um, the new year would probably be yeah. more appropriate. There's, I'm Certainly. sure there's going to be folks traveling during the holidays, and it may be some Certainly. folks that aren't here, so maybe. February, March time frame might be a good be time. So, all right, Sorry. thank you. Thank any you. any other business to, to conclude today? All right, seeing none, we're going to close the public hearing. Thank you.